The somewhat humorous story is told, today not so humorous in light of what we read from the Atomic Energy Commission coming out of Iran, about the time the leaders of Israel and Iran met behind the scenes to find the solution to their conflict, with, which threatens the existence of both nations. It happened some time ago. At that time, Ahmadinejad, so confident in the brilliance and abilities of his scientists, approached Prime Minister Netanyahu and proposed that each nation bring to an arena their strongest, most powerful, and vicious dog. And if Iran's dog won the fight, Israel and the United States would stop interfering in their nuclear program. And then, if Israel won the dog fight, Iran would stop its program of developing atomic bomb grade uranium. Both leaders agreed and a date was set for two years time when they would meet and the dog fight would take place. On that fateful day, the most decorated of Iran's elite national guard brought the most vicious looking 200 pound canine you had ever seen. Brought that dog into the ring and an Israeli schoolgirl led a golden doodle. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. Wagging its tail into the ring. No more than 15 seconds after the dogs were released, you know what happened. The Israeli golden doodle totally devoured the massive Iranian hound. Ahmadinejad was beside himself. He could not understand how this could have happened. How the Israeli pooch could have won. So in his frustration and anger, he turned to Prime Minister Netanyahu and said, for the past two years, our most brilliant veterinarians, geneticists, and nuclear scientists work together to breed the strongest, most aggressive, and most vicious fighting dog the world had ever seen. How is it possible that a docile golden doodle defeated the dog, and within seconds? To which Bibi replied, how? For the past two years, our most brilliant plastic surgeons were meticulously working to transform this most vicious Nile crocodile to look like a golden doodle. If you got his name, I could use it. Of course, Ahmadinejad reneged on the deal. Oh yes, we Jews hold our plastic surgeons in very high esteem. We want them, we need them. And as we take our first steps into the new year, we, we most certainly need to take to heart these, the message of today's Torah reading brings to us. It's a message that we are all in this together. Yes, at this time of year, we wish each other a Shana Tova. Have a good year. But the word Shana means more than year in Hebrew. It also means both to change and repeat. Without a doubt, last Rosh Hashanah and this Rosh Hashanah, these high holy days continue to put us and indeed the world through profound changes, just as 20 years ago on 9-11. We are, for the first time since the bombing of Pearl Harbor, fighting a war for our lives on the home front. It is the World War III of the COVID virus, our world war. Yes, so much has changed this past year and a half from hugging each other, kissing each other, and wishing each other a Shana Tova, to now, for many, continuing to express their feelings 
on their computers and Apple TVs, courtesy of Zoom. But change has not only come to the world of religion, but to the arena of finance. And so today, one's wealth and prosperity are often defined not by the money in the bank or the size of one's stock portfolio, but by the stockpile of toilet paper and our access to a Moderna or Pfizer booster vac vaccine shot. And certainly, our interest in the world of science and medicine has gone through a profound change as we hang on every word from the CDC, Dr. Jen, and Dr. Fauci. Now, there's a name for such an occurrence. What we have lived through and are living through is called a black swan. The whole concept of a black swan was popularized at the start of the 21st century by a man named Nissan Nicholas Taleb in his book, The Black Swan, The Impact of the Highly Improbable. And according to Taleb, a small number of black swans explain almost everything in our world, from the success of ideas and religions, the dynamics of historical events, to elements of our own personal lives. Black swans, seemingly from out of nowhere, unexpected, with a profound impact. If you really come to think of it, for each and every one of us, our individual and personal lives are a series of one black swan after another. There are days, weeks, and months when everything seems to go right. We are on a roll, as they say, and then, then all of a sudden, a world seems to crumble before our very eyes. As an example, I'll tell you one word and you will understand, not coronavirus. The word is cancer. You hear that word and nothing is ever the same. In a minute, your world has changed. So many of us have experienced black swans in our lives the sudden, sudden death of a spouse or a child, discovering a teenage child on drugs, being informed that your job was cut, or being told by our mother or father, more likely by their doctors, that they had dementia, or that our child was suffering from depression. It can be a car accident or financial reverse, Heart attack in the middle of the night, a fall on the steps, shortness of breath, or you feel a lump. And from that moment on, nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever be the same. And you wonder, how, how did it happen so fast? This feeling was beautifully expressed by Leonard Cohn in his version of the Una Sanatoka put the song, which begins with this refrain. Who by high ordeal, who by common trial, who in your merry, merry month of May, who by the very slow decay, and who shall I say is calling? Now, how do you survive such a world? This is the year to ask this question because the coronavirus affected all of us, physically, spiritually, and emotionally as well. All of a sudden, everything changed. What did we learn from this universal experience that touched all of us? Let me focus on three lessons we have learned. First lesson, there are things beyond our control. Second, there are things we can control. Third, with both in mind, where do we go from here? Let me begin to answer these questions by telling you the meaning of two Hebrew words, the real meaning of the words, mazel tov, 
We say it all the time, but what do these words really mean? On a simple level, they translate as good luck. But they are really meant to be understood on a deeper level. On a deeper level, they really mean good luck. So much so that there was a story told of the sainted Briskarov, who had a groom come to him and ask his Rebbe to give him a bracha, a blessing. The Rebbe said, Mazel tov. And then the groom said, can't you give me a more specific, a more powerful blessing? Th then the Rebbe said, Mazel tov is the greatest blessing you can have. Now the word mazel can mean fate or your astrological sign. But in its most basic form, it means pure luck. With this in mind, when things go wrong, there is one question not to ask and one answer not to give. The question not to ask is, why me? There are things in life over which we have absolutely no control. And when you are ill and go to the doctor, the doctor doesn't ask you if you have been good or bad. The doctor asks, asks you for your family history because our genetic makeup dictates in a large part whether we will be healthy or sick, whether it is malignant or benign. There are more than seven and a half billion people living on planet Earth. And 99.9% .9 of our genes are the same as everyone's else. The difference is the remaining 0.1% that could be the deciding factor between who shall live and who shall die. And there is nothing we can do about it. And knowing that, let's stop explaining the unexplainable with these oft-used words. Everything happens for a, rele uh, for a reason. You want proof that I'm right? Just listen to this. Three days after the US bombing of Hiroshima, our planes took off to drop another atom bomb. You know what the name of the city the target was? You don't know. It was Kuroko. That's right, not Nagasaki, Kuroko. What happened was there were heavy clouds over Kuroko and a split second decision was made to bomb Nagasaki instead. So some 50,000 people lost their lives in Nagasaki while some 50,000 people in Kuroko were saved. For a reason, Everything happens for a reason. You will never convince me of that. In the blink of an eye, in minutes, your whole world will change and you will find yourself wandering and wondering, how did it happen so fast? Some say this is a black swan. I tell you, that's life. So what are we to do when a black swan hits? Well, the off author of The Black Swan, Nisim Talib, concludes the book with 10 principles by which you cope with a black swan. You know what the 10th principle is? And I quote, make an omelet with the broken eggs. That's the best, this best-selling, world-renowned essayist and scholar and distinguished professor can come up with. Make an omelet with the broken eggs. Now with the pandemic slowing our lives down and at times bringing them to a halt, this gave us time to think about something we rarely pay much attention to, and that is ourselves. The truth of the matter is, we discovered things about ourselves that we may not have been aware of. We discovered that we can be resourceful when necessary and resilient and strong. 
We may not have been able to control the coronavirus, but we controlled whether to wear a mask or not, whether to get a vaccine or not. We may not have been able to control having children at home. That was out of our control. But how we reacted to that condition was in our control. The truth of the matter is, collectively, we have all undergone black swan experiences. And after one of those, we are never quite the same. We've learned from others and from ourselves a new way of doing things and looking at things. We were forced to confront the question of what is essential and what is not essential. Let me tell you something that every single, one, every single one of us discovered that was absolutely essential. Technology. For years we have been hearing debates regarding the pros and cons of modern technology. But during the coronavirus, we discovered that technology is absolutely essential. It was because of everything from WhatsApp to Zoom to FaceTime to Facebook to YouTube that we were able to stay connected at the Seder, during Shiva, and stay in touch with our doctors and children and grandchildren. And our children were able to continue to learn online. What a blessing for us at a time when many around the world I would say the majority, felt cursed by their isolation, which brought on depression and loneliness. That was their lot. Our experience with the coronavirus is a sharp reminder of how suddenly catastrophe can strike, even with every advantage and blessing that we have. It's a humbling wake-up call. We spend so much of our lives trying to control and plan every detail. And then we came to realize how little we actually can control. But it was the great physicist and concentration camp survivor, Viktor Frankl, who taught us, and I quote, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. So let's meet that challenge. When, now, Hayom, today, when no one knows what tomorrow may bring. And it all goes back to toilet paper. As Andy Rooney once pointed out, and we all have learned, that life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer it gets to the end, the faster it goes. So let's start living now, today, because you know what they say, it's never too late, it's later than you think. May God bless us with Shinat Chaim Tovim, a new year of health, happiness, and peace. And let us say, Amen. Amen.